Entrepreneurial Appetite is a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism, and supporting Black businesses. And so as I was talking, Drs. Randall and Pinkett, I've been doing this since 2018. We started in a burger joint, evolved into a book club. COVID-19 happened. We transitioned to Zoom. I realized we can get the author to come talk to the community. And so we have taken this and we've transformed it not only into these live discussions, but also podcasts. So if you all are interested in hearing our previous conversations with authors and entrepreneurs, check out the Entrepreneurial Appetite Black Book Discussions podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, iTunes, whatever. And those of you who support it today, um, our patrons, those of you who make donations to come on to the show and listen to the live discussions, me and two uh, friends of mine who graduated from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University started an endowment at our alma mater, our beloved alma mater called the From a and to PhD Endowed Scholarship. And this scholarship goes to support graduate students in the College of Education because that's where we started. And if not for a and the three of us wouldn't have gotten our PhDs. And I want to give a shout out to Brittany Patrick, who is a doctoral candidate who will be defending her dissertation this semester. So all the things that you all do to support us as part of how we give back to our community and our institutions. I also want to add that I have another podcast called the African Americans in Sport pod class. So me and two of my homeboys who are part of my academic family all teach a course about the African American experience in sport. And so we transformed our class during COVID-19 into a podcast. And so we have guests who can speak to the African American experience from being former student athletes, current student athletes, current athletes, historians, people who work on the business side of athletics come and talk to our students, but we have an opportunity to share those conversations with you all as an audience. So you might also wanna check out the African Americans in Sport pod class. And so now, without further ado, I want us to focus on our guests for today. And so we have Dr. Jeffrey A. Wright and Drs. Randall Pinkett, the authors of Black Faces and High Places. And if you notice over Dr. Pinkett's shoulder, he has their first book, Black Faces and Black Faces in White Places. And so uh, just a brief introduction. I'm gonna let these brothers talk about themselves in a moment, but just so you all know who we have here today, uh, Dr. Robinson, I believe you were recently named uh, the provost uh, at Rutgers University, Newark. And for those of you who aren't who aren't in academia, like if you watch Game of Thrones, okay, the provost <laughs> is the hand of the king, all right, or the queen, whoever's in charge. That that doesn't mean he's gonna get killed or anything like that. I'm just giving that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's get that right. <laughs> He is, he is the right hand of the king. So basically, the provost <laughs> is the is the internal president of the university, okay? So they make things, they really the people who run the university. And so uh, he he's had an academic journey from Rutgers to Georgia Tech to Columbia Business School. I believe he taught at NYU, came back to New Jersey to teach at Rutgers to start a center for innovation and entrepreneurship. And then we have his homeboy from way back, way back when. Uh, Dr. Pinkett, Dr. Randall Pinkett, who is the chairman of their company, BCT Partners. He was also a student at Rutgers, an undergrad with, um, with uh, Dr. Robinson. And he was a student athlete, if I'm not mistaken. And y'all might know who Myra Roll is. Myra Roll uh, is a former football player at Florida State who was a Rhodes Scholar. But before Myra Roll, there was Dr. Pinkett. And mm -hmm. so Dr. Pinkett had the opportunity to study at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, went on to get uh, another master's degree and maybe two master's degrees from MIT and a PhD. And so these are solid brothers, solid, solid brothers. But before we get into uh, a conversation about the book, I'm hoping that the two of you could share with us like who you, who you all are and what your relationship is. Because I think you all have an interesting brotherhood that speaks to in a lot of ways, what you all talk about in the book. So mm. talk about how you all met, how y'all got to do business together, and how you all were able to sustain and continue to doing business for like the past, what, 30, 30 some odd years, but then still have your own identities and your own professional backgrounds and your own accomplishments and all that good stuff. Well, I, I can I can kick it off and let me begin by saying, uh, Brother Langston, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. We appreciate your voice and appreciate the work that you're doing in 
collaboration with some of your classmates and friends and others in your network. Um, I got to give a shout to uh, to A and T. I got to give a shout to Aggie Pride. Uh, I've got I got some Aggies in my in my inner circle, and All right. uh, I know something about the power of Aggie Pride. It is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. Mm. I'll tell you that. So uh, right. proud to see you and uh, you know you and the other uh, A and T alums continuing to cont continuing the legacy of that institution, which is a, a, a an incredible, tremendous institution. Um, Having said that, uh, a housekeeping note, there's some comments in the Q&A from folks saying oh, yeah. that the chat is disabled. Oh. So, uh, so okay. while I'm responding to your question, I'll, I'll leave you to perhaps uh, yeah, I appreciate that. change settings on, on the chat and, and we'll let folks uh, talk to us via chat. But to get to your question now, uh, I, I often say that you're not going to find two people who are closer than Dr. Robinson and I, uh, unless they were born from the same womb, yeah. uh, we are, uh, we are, we are, I don't say he is like my brother. I say he is my brother because he is my brother. Uh, we uh, met in the first semester at the first meeting of the Rutgers chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. Uh, we sat just adjacent to each other and when prompted to Turned to our neighbor. We turned to each other. He said, I'm Jeff Robinson. I, 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 then and even now, I, I said, I'm Randy Pinkett. And that was the, the, the genesis of our, 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 our relationship. Um, since then, we have uh, been roommates in college. We have been fraternity line brothers in Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. We have been business partners, co-founders of several businesses. We have been co-authors of several books. Yep. We are the best men, or we were the best men in each other's weddings. And our children uh, both refer to us as their uncle. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's been uh, roughly 30 years, some probably, probably upwards of 30 years. I've stopped counting. Dr. Robinson will get me right. Uh, I call him JR. JR will get me right. But uh yeah, we, you know, one of, my, one of the things I often say also, and then I'll pass the baton to the to the, to the provost, is uh, there's a wonderful line in a song from the uh, Broadway play Hamilton, uh, where they say, uh, what are the odds the gods would put us all in one spot? Mm -hmm. And I, I often lament uh, of both of us attending Rutgers at the same time, in the same department, uh, sitting adjacent to each other. I mean, what are the odds the gods would put us in the in that same spot? And uh, I believe it was uh, God's hand that said, you, you all are destined to connect. And there's two others that Dr. Robinson might mention, uh, Dallas Grundy and Lawrence Hibbert, as we play out the story. Dr. Robinson, what would you add? Well, you, 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 you got it right. The other parts of that story, um, you have to do with the the other folks who were around us you know, we were all engineering students and we were, you know, uh, having some of the same experiences and, you know, all being on campus and, and for the first time you're, you're, you're eager to, to get things done, trying to feel out this new place. Um, when we were uh, undergrads, we, we established a big brother, uh, little brother, big sister, little sister program for um, the other engineering students in the National Society of Black Engineers chapter at Rutgers. And uh, there were uh, two brothers, uh, two young, <laughs> younger brothers who we were the mentors for. Uh, one was named Dallas Grundy. He had the same major as me, civil engineering. The other was uh, named Lawrence Hibbert. Um, you know, just fast forward a bit through that, that whole, whole time in our life. Uh, we became the core of, of, of several business ventures. These four mm -hmm. um, you know, student leaders, we were all student leaders and student organizations on campus. We learned how to work with one another as college students. And by the time we got to our fourth year, their third year, you know, we were starting to think about, well, what kind of business could we create and what will we do with it? And those same bonds have carried us um, through that that thirty year, thirty three year arc, and it has um, has been you know a unique 
uh, brotherhood partnership. Um, because we, you know, we, we, people say all the time, they say things like, oh, never go into business with friends. Well, you know, that, think about that very in a, in a logical sense. Who are you going to go into business with? Yeah. Enemies? No. <laughs> you, you, it's going to be somebody who, who hopefully you respect. But, you know, obviously every, we got all kinds of friends. Some friends, we use that, that term friend, uh, you know, pretty liberally these days because people yeah. friend people on Facebook and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, the reality is you need to be in business with people who you can argue with and then still be respectful and be friendly later on. And if yeah. you, you get, you can't go into business or be in partnership with people who are going to be offended easily or who are going to be uh, the kinds of folks who, you know, you say one wrong thing and they, they go off uh, never to talk to you again. Mm. Uh, and so because we had that kind of, of respect and friendship, uh, brotherhood with one another, and then also brought other people into that circle. That is part of the secret of that success. We we tell a bit of that story in um, you know in this book as well. But it is, I'm glad that you pointed it out because it is a core, and we hope more people look at that. People think entrepreneurship is a is a game, uh, a solo game, and that, that's yeah. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. the, the best entrepreneurs are always working in teams. You just don't realize it. And the, hopefully, we're an example of that. So I, I want to get an audience some context for me, because before before everyone jumped on, I was having a conversation with you all about how familiar I am with you all. So so if y'all in the audience see me cheesing more than normal, <laughs> it, it's because this book and these guys, even though this is my first time meeting them, has so many connections to my own life. So for an example, we mentioned that Dr. Pinkett went to Hightstown High School, which is in East Windsor, New Jersey. So I went to high school in West Windsor, New Jersey. So his high school was my high school's rivals, right? So I, I grew up and got my, my spiritual grounding and found my faith at First Baptist Church of Lincoln Gardens in Somerset, New Jersey. Like that's <laughs> that's where like, you know, that was a connecting point for me and black community because I grew up in a place where there weren't a lot of black folk. And so a few months ago, we had Pastor Stories on talking about his book, uh, Say Yes to No Debt. Mm -hmm. I also want to add that... Uh, the book mentions the New Jersey Orators as an organization that was created to uh, help young Black folk master the skills of getting in front of people and talking. And so my father started started the uh, New Jersey Orators chapter in our region in New Jersey. And so there were so many things in this book that lit up for me and that I appreciated. And I just want to encourage everyone in the audience to get the book. And one of the things I want to start off talking about with you all is the format. And so the book is, is part biographical. You talk about other folks who have been successful, other folks who made it to the top and stayed, other folks who made it to the top and didn't stay. The book is part autobiographical. You mm -hmm. talk about your life. Because I, I remember those little points. So when Dr. Pinkett did this, or <laughs> when Dr. Robinson was doing that, right? The book is also part case study, right? The book is part qualitative, part quantitative, and it's part spiritual, right? So yeah. talk about like the methodology, the thought process, and how you organize the book before we get into like the deep content of the book. I appreciate the question and the, and the, 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 the thoughtful reflection on, on the book. Uh, so we both have backgrounds in, in research. Uh, Dr. Robinson, his experience far exceeds mine. Uh, as an academic, as a professor, uh, as as someone who uh, has lived the life of publish or perish and is tenured and in an endowed chair and et cetera. Uh, but I did earn a PhD, as did Dr. Robinson. So we have uh, an academic research orientation uh, toward these matters. Uh, now, to your, to, your, to your narrative, the original vision for our first book was to be fully autobiographical. Mm -hmm. We wanted to tell our stories as black faces in white places. Make a long story short, the publishing community wasn't quite enthusiastic about our story. I say in their words, not my words, it wasn't, it wasn't enough rags to riches. You guys were smart kids who did well and you've accomplished, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. not enough rags to riches. Those are their words, not mine. So we went back to the drawing board for that book and said, we're going to reformulate the formula. And upon the advice of our then book agent, our Earl Cox, I'll give Earl a shout on that. 
He said, why don't you think about packaging it as strategies mm. and then bring in examples of other prominent figures who have lived out those strategies. So then we did a ton of interviews, a ton of interviews of successful African-Americans, Senator Cory Booker, who was then mayor of Newark, right. Benjamin Jealous, then president of the NAACP, Angela Glover Blackwell, who ran PolicyLink, a renowned policy research advocacy organization in on the West Coast. Uh, the list goes on. Roland Martin, Deb Elam, who's an executive at General Electric, Don Thompson, executive at, at McDonald's. The list just goes on and on and on across multiple sectors. And as we're interviewing these prominent African-Americans and reflecting on our lived experience, we're beginning to see patterns of how they've navigated these environments to success and what we then defined in this book as significance. And so we distilled the patterns that we heard into what we call in this book, these 10 strategic actions, 10 patterns, 10 recurring themes, 10 actions that they all had in common along their journey to getting to the top and perhaps more importantly, staying at the top. And so then we did more art than science of taking our research, melding it with other research like that of mm -hmm. David Thomas, now president of Morehouse, weaving in the narratives of those we interviewed, even narratives of those we didn't interview, weaving in our narratives and weaving it into the tapestry of the 10 strategic actions. Mm -hmm. And and one of the, you said, I wanted to talk about it later, but since you brought it up, there's, I. I was telling y'all about the nuggets that are in this book. And since you mentioned success, what is, what is it? It's success versus uh, significance. Significance. Mm -hmm. break, break down the difference between su success and significance. Oh, well, I mean, that's, that's easy. Su success is what you think of on an individual basis. Of it's, um, it, it's about what I am able to accomplish. And people talk, often talk about success uh, as what I'm able to to do myself, or even if I get help from others, it's still about um, me promoting what I'm able to do, um, and it doesn't necessarily leave a lot of room for other other people. Mm. Significance is a theme we we heard many times from the people we interviewed and profiled in the book, uh, where they were thinking about beyond themselves. You know. All of these folks were successful, you know, from the standpoint of they achieved something. Uh, they achieved uh, a particular position and, and did some things. But significance meant they were leaving a legacy. They were doing something that was going to impact others um, who may follow them, um, that will allow their, their, their name, their, their uh, you know, their, their, the way that they think about things, um, things that they value to carry on beyond um, their personal success, and, and we we end the book with you know with that with those um, quotes and started to think about how uh, we can leave that kind of legacy. Yeah, I found it inspiring to hear what you were saying about what you and and uh, other folks from North Carolina A and T are doing. I mean, that is, it, it, it's a repre <laughs> it represents something we talk about in the book about how you can you know collaborate with others to do giving. You know, we people talk call it philanthropy, and you know, got fancy words for it. But what you're doing, uh, endowing a scholarship or uh, providing funds for other for other students for students to be able to matriculate through the university, that stuff matters because some, now your legacy, your intentions are being telegraphed into the future. That's significance, not just success. Yeah. So let's go to the beginning of the book, because the beginning of the book to me it was it was kind of funny because I didn't know about some of the people who were mentioned. And the book begins with failures. Failures according to like the framework that we have here. Like there were black people who made it to high places. They didn't stay and they didn't do, do the uplift, the lifting as they climb mm. as part of that. So talk about, talk about the anti-black face in high, in high place and, and why you all decided to start with that. And then let's get into the 10 strategic steps that black folk can 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 take and make to be able to be a black face in a high place. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll, I'll preface my answer by saying uh, this book, which is our second book, as you mentioned, 
was a real coming of age for uh, JR and I uh, as authors. You know, we were just finding our voice in the first book collectively, but I think we, I think we found it. <laughs> and then for this book, uh, perhaps more so than the last one, although there were elements of this, we, we really tried to treat it like, like art. Mm. Like what's the tap, what's the texture or the, the tapestry that we're trying to create in each chapter, a different experience. And like the arc as we were kind of whiteboarding the, the introduction, the arc of the introduction was, was we're gonna jump, kick in with the murder of George Floyd, mm. um, you know, respectfully, but appropriately because it was such a pivotal moment that prompted us to write the book, but also it brought many black leaders to a crossroads typified by this idea of being in a high place and having levers of power. But then we're like, okay, we wanna paint that picture but this is about getting to the top and staying there. And the fact is not everybody gets to the top and stays there, which mm. might even be a misnomer. Most people might assume once you get to the top, like you've arrived, mm. that's not the case. Yeah. So we're like, can we find some really strong examples of people who made it to the top and something about their, for lack of a better phrase, lack of preparedness mm. for when they arrived at the high place undermined their arrival in the high place. And so mm. among the several stories we, we told, one was uh, Lauren Hill, uh, you know, and we adore Lauren Hill. Uh, but if you know Lauren Hill's story, you know that after she won five Grammys and made history and was the first artist, I'm sorry, the first hip hop artist to be named uh, album of the year, she disappeared. She, she, she literally disappeared for years. And no one saw nor heard from her until she resurfaced with tax evasion and then jail time. Mm -hmm. And in her yeah. words, not mine, she wasn't ready. Mm. She hadn't really solidified her identity, one of the strategic actions we talk about. And then the other uh, that, I, that I think is really powerful, which you mentioned, I think uh, implicitly was Rodney Hunt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rodney Hunt, this tech entrepreneur who ran a near billion dollar company and had all of the signs and the trappings of traditional success, sells his company. And I visited Rodney at his house. It was a mansion. I had to go through security and then security security just to sit down with him in the living room. This cat then goes into failed ventures, tries to start a hip hop label, uh, lives this lavish lifestyle like he's like, 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 like he's, uh, like he's a hip hop artist gone wrong. Because <laughs> nowadays hip hop artists go right. But he's yeah. a hip hop artist gone wrong, blows away all of his money, and then ends up having his house in foreclosure. Mm. <laughs> so, so, you know, these stories created the arc of the introduction to say, this book is here to help you not go there. Yeah. <laughs> that when you arrive, you're ready and you're conscious and you understand your responsibility. That's right. Not just to yourself, but also to other people. Success yeah. and significance. So let's let's get into the to the strategic actions. What what are the strategic actions that Black folks can take, Black professionals can take, to reach the top and stay there? <laughs> the convenient answer is all you got to do is read the book. You can That's see right. What the <laughs> That's very convenient. That's right. Uh, we give you we give you a little some little snippets. Yeah, you know? yeah. What what are what are I guess let's let's do this. What are they're all important. They all, all of the strategic actions are important. But what what do you think are the ones that stand out the most or are most prominent? I think the first one in terms of like the identity and knowing yourself is yeah. is crucial. I think yeah. that that is absolutely crucial. And um, and, and and you're right. And and you know. When we've talked about this before, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Pinky because he, he loves talking about this. The, the, the scaffolding in the book is, is you have to forgive us because remember we, we started in engineering. So the, everything got to make sense to us. We got to put the pieces together. Yeah. And literally we wanted the different strategic actions to build upon one another. So that um, there are some things that happen in, in strategic actions one, two, and three which are foundational to helping you get to strategic actions four, five, and six. Yeah. Um, 
And so we, we are thinking about those things along the way. Um, and as those of you who've opened the book know, we have lots of graphics that, that tell the story. Uh, and so I, I, I definitely agree with you. There's, a, there's an inside out approach to what we, how we, we thought about this. And I'll let, the, I'll let Dr. Pinkett kick us off with, uh, with the, 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 first, the first sections. Yeah, so I, I agree, uh, Brother Langston, that Strategic Action One is foremost, it is foundational, it is fundamental. It is the foundation of the foundation, and that is exercising self-determination. Self-determination being comprised of two underlying concepts, identity and purpose. Identity is knowing who you are, because if you do not define yourself, somebody else will. Mm. And purpose is knowing your direction, knowing your calling. Some might call it your mission or why you're on this earth. And if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Any road. And so it's the combination of knowing who you are, which represents your anchor. It grounds you. Mm. And your purpose is your compass. It guides you. Yeah. That going back to the stories, the higher you get in these organizations and institutions and in your career, the harder the winds blow of expectation and pressure and et cetera, which means identity is your anchor. It keeps you grounded when those winds are blowing. And then purpose is your compass. It helps direct you to not get taken off course. And if you have not done the inner work to ask yourself the question, who am I? And what is my calling? You know, mm -hmm. the, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. That's right. You haven't done that inner work. By the time you get to the high place, think Lauren Hill, think Rodney Hunt, it's too late. Mm. It's too late. And, and so, so the, the next you know, section of the book really takes uh, that, that, that foundation and starts to build on it. I mean, our, um, you know, independent, Action is what we're what we're talking about the inside part, but as you start to uh, start thinking about what direction you're going to go and and understanding what your purpose and meaning are, then you you start to get into uh, the the need to interrelate with others. So this in, interdependent action, how are we uh, connected to other folks? And it's three there's three chapters there that um, have a lot of weight for those folks who are navigating their their life and career, network and build uh, power, um, maximizing mentoring and, and leveraging uh, our might. And in all of those cases, you know, we, we're, we're pretty specific about how to uh, think strategically about who you, who you connect with and how you use power um, in, in your interaction with others and, and how, how we need to have other people in our lives um, multiple people in our lives who are giving us guidance along the way just to make that journey um, more palatable and, and, and useful. And, and then leveraging organizations and how we organize ourselves, whether it's for protest, whether it's for um, creating those, those, or, those, those organizations or companies or, or um, you know, other types of social enterprises and things that where you're working with other people to achieve that goal how much more powerful we are when we are working with one another. Th those three are so important for, for, for anybody who says that I want to make a difference in this world. Mm. And so again, we, we got some wonderful stories um, in the midst of all of that to uh, really illustrate those points. There's a concept that I love. I love it in my own life and I love it how you all talked about it. And you all talk about multiple forms of capital. And I think mm -hmm. all the different forms there's human capital, there's cultural capital, there was like monetary capital. That's the right. One that, the one that sticks out the most to me though, and the one that I think I identify the most with is social capital. Yeah. And I think like social capital is a is like is a meta theme in this book. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you why, like I read it that way. One, I'm biased towards social capital just to begin with. <laughs> um, two, you all talk about social capital, but then you wouldn't have been able to write this book without social capital, mm, right? Fair. So you all got access to people and stories that, you know, other people don't have access to. So, so let's, 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 let's talk a little bit about cultivating social capital and what that can do for folks 
as they're getting to those high places and as they're staying in those high places? How do you use social capital? Well, first, you got to build it. You got to build mm. social capital. And that's about relationships. Um, it's, it's, it's about having uh, people who, who you've been working with when that you met in our case that you meet in as a, as a college student in student organizations or you know, that you meet you know, at church or other organizations, fraternities, sororities. And um, every time you're, you're, you meet people, you don't throw away that whole part of your network when you move on to the next day. You're That's keeping right. those parts of your network. And, you know, as people move into companies and corporations, they're using those relationships um, to make their way. And, and you know, we got lots of research that backs it up. So uh, you're building it along the way. And at some point, you, you spend capital. Uh, you know, we always talked about, you know, we think about, you know, you talk about money, financial capital, you spend it to get something done or to accomplish something or to uh, have some people do some things. But social capital can be spent in the same way. That's what makes it, uh, you know, so, so special and interesting. And it can help you to achieve those things that you say you want to achieve. So it, it certainly plays into everyday life. The, all the things that I've done and all the things I do with the guy on the other side of that screen there, Dr. Pinkett, he and I um, have leveraged our own social capital, each other's social capital, the social capital we've built through companies um, and through relationships and universities, and institutions to make things happen. Because when you do that, uh, that that's what makes change. That's why social capital is so important. When I when I read the the part of the book that talks about capital, one of the, one of the things that popped into my mind is is that we we can never be broke. Right. And what I, what I mean by that is is that that even if you don't have we was that like everyone's talking about venture capital right now and angel mm -hmm. investors and how black folk don't have a lot of access to those to those types of funds to support, start, start and support their businesses. But we can still leverage these other types of capital, right? And I think that there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of strategy and insights that can be taken from those parts that talk about building relationships and, and leveraging who you are to help others and get help from others. Another thing that stood out to me that I'm wrestling with, um, and I wrestle with this as, as a millennial, and I, I wrestle with mentorship because mm -hmm. on the one hand, I am part of a brilliant, a, an absolutely brilliant academic family. Like I have academic fathers who took care of me and a group of like 20 to 25 brothers who all got their PhDs from the University of Texas. And I can call, I can call so-and-so who graduated three years before I did in a doctoral program and I'm connected to him. Mm -hmm. I can connect uh, Daniel Thomas, who graduated last year with Albert Bemper, who graduated in 2012, and they never crossed paths at UT. But now as a professional, I feel like in some ways I feel a washout because I don't, I don't, I don't feel the same type of mentorship that I had in school in my professional life. Mm, and yeah. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not suffering. I can still lean on the, 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 the previous relationships. But what do you do when you're like in a, men, in a mentoring desert? And I would add, let me add this. Let me add this. I was thinking about this. I, maybe I put too much emphasis on having a black mentor. Because you all state in the book that in order for you to really grow and thrive, you need a diverse group of mentors. But for me, one, I had a great set of mentors in my doctoral program, but most of my life, I hadn't had access to Black mentors. There's only two times, A&T and UT. Mm -hmm. but, but other than that, it doesn't exist. So I'm always looking for the Black person to be my mentor. So how, mm -hmm. do, how do we cope with that? How do we cope with being in an environment where we want a Black mentor because we don't see a lot of us, but then also being open to the fact that like we need to leverage other people's mentorship and sponsorship, and that that's part of how we cultivate social capital. Yeah, Jerry, you, you got to take that one. That's, that's, <laughs> that's tailor made. It's tailor made for you, bro. <laughs> well, well, look, it is um, the further the, the the higher you move up, the more that you progress in your career. It is you know, harder and harder to find mentors that that are just like you. So there, you know, there's two dimensions to this. There is 
the fact that the folk that do have um, have achieved these things and got to those high, higher heights, everybody's trying to get to them as a mentor. <laughs> Right. So that's a that's a challenge for for you know those of us who've gotten to certain places. Everybody comes up to you and says, "Hello, can then can you be my mentor?" Because we we are looking for that. We we say you gotta have more than one mentor. So let's not put this all on one person. Not that that was what you were doing, but yeah. sometimes people think it's it's only one, and you got one one mentor. That's old school thinking. Yeah. New school thinking is you got mentors who play different roles. We talk about that in the book. Um, we, we, we talk about nine different roles. And so for some of us, we do, do need a black mentor who can uh, give us some insight and that's important, but that may not be the same person who gives us the career advice. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's been studies then that, that, you know, David Thomas, who's now president of Morehouse, um, is, uh, one of the folks who wrote about what was then called cross-cultural mentoring. And he said, you know, that it can work. You can yeah. be uh, feel as get as a, uh, be as effective uh, when a mere mentor does, is, doesn't have the same identity uh, as you. If 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 that person you know has these characteristics, um, certain characteristics, what we would probably call an ally today, and mm -hmm. that you have a conversation about um, you know what we're going to talk about and how we're going to talk about things, especially when things are are looking like um, you know hidden racism and, and, and the like. So you, you can find, and, and there, and since there's more, um, in, in, you know, let's get specific, there's more, you know, white, uh, administrators out there. If I wanted to talk, uh, to, to a black provost, <laughs> you know, from a research one institution, yeah. you know, there ain't yeah. that many. It's not it really it's not. And, and I, I'm still, still trying to actually figure out what the number is for R ones and R twos. But let me just say this: it ain't that many. Yeah. So I've got to accept the fact that, no, I, I'm going to get some mentorship from this person who's not Black, but it may not be the only mentor that I have. Yeah. So I'm going to get some knowledge and this person can fulfill some of these roles that I need as a person who is um, emerging into a, a profession or has gotten to a certain place. And then I will also have some other mentors who will be able to help me and support me as, as a Black man. And um, the combination, that whole, gives me something that is valuable, you know, where I can maximize uh, the effectiveness of mentoring. And I believe that's in, true in academia, but that's, that's true in corporations and other professions as well. Let's so talk would about you add to that, Dr. Pinky? Because I know, I know mm -hmm. you, you're thinking, thinking out loud there. No, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to Brother, Brother Langston. We'll keep the conversation <laughs> going. You, you, so, know, you, 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 kill, you got it. So I'm, I'm just, this is, this is like a thing I'm wrestling with. So. Let's, let's talk about reverse mentoring mm -hmm. because um, I believe that there are some millennials who, who aren't young, that we're just younger, right? And that there, there are like hidden tensions between millennial professionals who are coming into their career and older black professionals who are, was it Gen, Gen X and young boomers who are in these positions and the dynamic is traditionally older mentor younger but but how do we how do we be intentional about reversing that and putting the millennial who knows how to leverage social media who knows how to leverage tiktok who's sort of in between was it who's it who did, what are they calling the kids coming up gen I don't know what they calling them yeah it was gen, yeah gen z and millennial z, whatever yeah. it is whatever they are mm -hmm. right so we're kind of like <laughs> a buffer between them and their kids and their grandkids. Mm -hmm. how, how do we be intentional about reverse mentorship so that the folks who are coming up can teach the people who are already in the high places? No, and, and, and that concept of reverse mentoring, which is a supposedly less experienced professional mm -hmm. mentoring, supposedly a more experienced professional, well, I say supposedly because we actually uh, recast that in the context of of wisdom, and, and we we talk about seeking the wisdom of others. Mm. And when you couch it in those words, there is always something you can learn from somebody else. That's right. And so, even if you may have more experience than me, 
there are certain matters for which I have greater wisdom than you. And that creates a different power dynamic between somebody who may be younger and somebody who may be older to say, well, there is a lot I can learn from you and there's a lot you can learn from me. Mm. It's mutually beneficial. And so I think the mindset of the millennial has to be, I bring something to the table because yeah. if you don't come with that mindset, you're already taking yourself out of the game. You That's see right. it as a unidirectional, one directional prospective relationships. So let's just get the mindset right. Mm. Once we get the mindset right, I think it's, it's two things. I think it is uh, not shying away from what you bring to the table. I'll give you a classic example. We bring in a student for the summer internship and we're at a meeting having a discussion and they don't want to say anything because they don't think they have anything to say. Mm. And my invitation to them is the greatest value you bring to this meeting is your perspective. You see it differently than we do. And because you see it differently, I want to hear what you have to say. So please don't shy away from exercising your voice. Yeah. Second part is, and it gets back to strategic action three, which is about self-mastery. Uh, I believe in the law of attraction, mm. that when you bring your best and do your best and show your best, you are highly more likely to attract a mentor. Because people yeah. want to invest their time in people that are doing something. Now, granted, there is this idea of philanthropy and helping others who may be disadvantaged or may need to kind of have a leg up. But I'll tell you right now, successful folk want to see something in someone else about their success that they can help to amplify that success. Yeah. So you got to do the work. You got to you know, put in the, the 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 time and the effort and the sweat equity to be on your grind. And when you are on your grind, you are going to attract others who are saying, I want to help them grind more. Yeah. Yeah. There's something else I'm wrestling with, okay? I'm wrestling with, and I'm going to frame it this way, even though you all didn't frame it this way in the book. Entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship. And I, I frame it like that because I, I think there's sometimes like we have tensions where there's like a, a group of black folk who are like, we need to build for ourselves. We need to have our own stuff, our own grocery <laughs> stores, our own banks, our own uh, gas stations, our own libraries, our own schools, yeah. everything. And that's very much that's so entrepreneurship. True. Yeah. And then we have entrepreneurship. And that's nav navigating a mainstream institution, or in my case, a Hispanic serving institution. And so talk about how you all, because to me, Y'all ease that tension really well in this book. So talk about how you all, how you all view entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship or with one another. Yes, yeah, 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 it's interesting the way you put that because you know obviously there's there's a classic uh, discussion of, that goes on. It's been in the black community for a long time <laughs> that that goes down that that street. But we we did try to ease the the, the tension between the two. And part of it is that the skill sets necessary to, to navigate and to achieve some things, get some things done, are the, are the same, whether you are inside of the corporation or whether you are um, creating your own. Um, we, so that's, that's how that section of the book starts. It, it's, mm. it's about understanding um, you know, what are some of those elements of being entrepreneurial. And then we put it in the context of, well, if you're going to be entrepreneurial inside of a large organization, that's entrepreneurship. And here are some things that we would suggest to you about how to be that, um, that entrepreneur and then how to be a social entrepreneur, being mm -hmm. concerned and, uh, and being uh, creative and innovative about how to direct some of those resources towards a double or, or triple bottom line where the things that you're doing for the company to meet the company's objectives also have a positive impact on our community. And that right there, that, that is where the innovation comes through. And that is where um, the creativity is necessary um, to be on the inside. And then according to the classical approach to thinking about entrepreneurship, but we, we didn't wanna just talk about, you know, some of the entrepreneurship that uh, we talked about in, the, in our first book, you know, it, it's sort of the path to getting into the game of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. We wanted to speak to those who were thinking about scaling up those ventures yeah. so that they are 
the job creators uh, so that they are the institutions that are built and that can transform the community so that when you know somebody is having an HBCU or another a school or, or another organization is having financial problems, they, they can turn to the, the business people in the community and say, how can you how can you help and support us? So you know th th that's how we approached it. And that's what we were thinking that both of those are important. And both are critical to um, what we think of in the last part of the book about transforming systems, that you can't transform the systems that we all talk about without having some, not only resources, yeah. but also having organization institutions that uh, uh, allow you, um, that can force the question, make the changes uh, and make a difference. Yeah. And I'll just add one thing, or actually two things to what Dr. Robinson said. Uh, I want the listeners to know that it's there. There's no right or wrong path. It's not like entrepreneurship is more revered uh, as a, as a calling for a black professional than entrepreneurship. They're both equally valid paths. It goes back to purpose. Some of us are called to entrepreneurship. Some of us are called to entrepreneurship. The two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. So do the do the self reflection to understand what is the right path for you. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. We've seen mm. people go in between both. Uh, Dr. Robinson's a great example. He's a provost right. and he's an entrepreneur. He's done both. Um, but secondly, uh, I want to say that this, uh, this framing of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship fund, you know, found, you know, predicated on the same mindset, the entrepreneur's mindset powers, entrepreneurship and the powers entrepreneurship but they are so inextricably linked to the empowerment of our community i'll say it differently right. for example there is no way in the world my company our company bct partners grows to be one of the largest black owned businesses were it not for blacks in institutions getting us contracts yeah. it doesn't happen yeah. without representation of folks in Fortune 500s, private foundations, government agencies who lobbied for us, we would have never even been given a shot. Mm. And conversely, many of them, when they've been uh, downsized, right-sized, let go, I say set free, the first place they come is to us because they know that they have a home. Yeah. And so we have the yeah. ability to control who gets hired, who gets the job, yeah. who gets the internship, mm -hmm. where the dollars get donated. And so it, it goes both ways. We need folks working on both fronts. That's right. That's good. Because I, I skew towards straight up entrepreneurship. But <laughs> I, I need to hear that every now and then. You know what I mean? I need to hear that every now and then. Okay. Yeah. So I got a I whole bunch it. of stuff I want to cover. I got to give the audience a chance to ask some yeah. questions. So audience, if y'all have questions, type them in the chat. Or you can raise your hand in the Q&A function. And what I'll do is I'll come over and when the time is right, I'll unmute you, but you got to be ready and you can ask your question live to um, live to our guest today. But just know this, that if anybody is Zoom bombing, I'm going to kick you out real quick. So don't ask nothing inappropriate, do anything inappropriate. So while you all are getting your questions together, let me, um, let me ask this question because I'm wrestling with something else, okay? So I go to a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the Black Chamber events. And we, we should talk about murders, murders and acquisitions because in San Antonio, we like Black people like 5% of the population. We have two chambers of commerce. That's another conversation. But um, we, we do. I, even talking to my students where I work, people want to start nonprofits. Mm. And, in, and I'm like, yo, we have too many Black nonprofits. I don't think we need any more Black nonprofits Everybody wants to do a nonprofit mm. and it doesn't seem like people are putting as much energy into creating the multi-million dollar, the multi-billion dollar business mm. as, as we should. Now, I'm not hating on anybody, I'm not judging folks for wanting to start their nonprofit because I think they have um, callings. I think they have altruistic motives, but I just see it's just, it, it, it's just like way too much of it. This is too much. Mm -hmm. It may, maybe I'm wrong. Y'all, y'all correct me. So how do mm -hmm. how do we shift the mindset from from like you can do the same thing nonprofit, 
and have the multi-million dollar business. How, how, does, how do we start to like change that mindset and not to say that having your nonprofit is wrong or anything like that? Y'all know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I took a first a first response and, and I'm going to take it from two angles. One is um, I so appreciate the framing of the question because you're one of the first or few interviews we've had where we've actually gotten into this issue around scale. Mm -hmm. And strategic action nine is uh, about reaching scale. Uh, we have too many nonprofits and we have too many small businesses. Mm. Said differently, we don't have enough organizations or institutions that have reached scale. And in an era of consolidation that we're witnessing, what I mean, what do I mean by that? Where partly from the pandemic, partly from the economy, there are fewer and fewer players in a given industry. And those who remain are bigger today than they were before. Think yeah. Home Depot versus the corner store. Think Walmart versus the grocery store. <laughs> Think that there once was American Airlines and United and Continental and U.S. Airways. And now there's just two amongst those four. Think Federal Express and what was once called Kinko's, mm. then FedEx office. I mean, there are, I mean, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, right? Yeah. Like, like that's, the, that's the scale we're talking about. Bank of yeah. America and Merrill Lynch came together. We're, li we're living in an era of scale and consolidations, said more simply. While there will always be a place for small organizations, it is increasingly harder to compete and survive if you're small. Mm. So our argument in Strategic Action 9 is we have to be thinking about mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, because it is only those three partnerships that accomplish two things, integration of resources and consolidation of their capacity. And so now getting back to the other thread of your comment, uh, I think partly what we have to be thinking is, is not am I creating a new wheel, but how do I align the wheel that I'm envisioning to help bolster somebody's existing wheel? Mm -hmm. Don't create a new entity unnecessarily if you can help bolster an existing one to do what they do better, faster, larger, and at greater scale. Yeah. Uh, so you, So you're not wrong. You're absolutely right. And so this gets to mergers and acquisitions. And a, another story that, that is weaved throughout the book is BET and Radio One, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. let, let's talk about that, right? So I'm, I'm in a community here in San, we got two black chambers. We got a um, couple other nonprofits that do, do business stuff. What, what's 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 the first conversation or how do you start the conversation about mergers and acquisitions within black community or just even alignment of of like our own interest convergence? Right. How, how do how do we how do we adopt a mindset or start those types of conversations about, around our own businesses and nonprofits? Yeah, well, you know, mergers and acquisition is the is, is the advanced conversation. I think the starting point is partnering, mm. you know, working together. Because if you're going to get to the merger and acquisition piece, you know, there's a lot that has to take place in order for that. And, and there's, some, there's some steps that you could take in that direction, you know, that would, that would be able to sort of test out whether a merger or acquisition is going to really work. So, you, you know, you, you do some, some um, collaboration and you do some, some uh, you know, some co we call it co-location, or you you get a joint venture going, but and then you start to see whether or not the culture and um, and the systems are gonna are gonna match up and map up. There is certainly some reasons why you might want to acquire another company, or why you might merge with another company, but it does take some uh, you know so, some testing it out, and and often you know we do tell a story about. Um, Kathy Hughes and, and Bob Johnson uh, of Radio One at the time and uh, and BET and if you know for those of us of a certain age you know those those were it was that was black radio and That's that right. was black TV yeah. and there was a moment that we we document and talk about in the book where um, where there was a conversation between those two um, entrepreneurs uh, Alfred Liggins was part of the discussion too on the Radio One side to 
bring those two companies together. And imagine what that would have been like in the early 90s, where you would have all of black TV and all of black radio under one one roof. Yeah. But you know what what stopped that from happening? I, there was a it was a real cultural clash between those two companies. Mm. Um, you know, Radio One was was run more like a family business, and BET was run more uh, of a of a more like a corporation. Um, Bob Johnson had a way that he wanted to do things. Um, Kathy Hughes, Alfred Liggins had a way they wanted to do things. They there was some personality clashes as well, but it, it's just. Um, it's so interesting to even conceive of the possibility of trying to pull those two things, those two companies together. And of course, if you follow the, the arc of the story, you know, BET eventually gets sold to Viacom and Radio One becomes Urban One by adding TV One, a television station, um, which again, has had its um, the different aspects of it um, put together. So, so not the easiest thing to do at that scale, but yeah. something we need to be thinking about because the 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 you know there's the, the there's a conversation or the 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 saying that says you know you can you can be the captain of a tugboat or mm -hmm. you could be the second mate of a cruise ship. That's now right. if you don't understand the the analogy, tugboat's small, cruise ship <laughs> big. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we can't get past that that stage and that conversation, uh, but. You know, Dr. Pinkett can tell you some of his own stories about attempting mergers and, and acquisitions, which now he does on a more of a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say very briefly two things. Uh, we've been able to grow BCT through mergers, acquisitions, and joint ventures. Um, we've done two acquisitions. We've probably done four or five joint ventures in different uh, shapes and forms. And it has been a significant catalyst to, to our growth. Um, and to your earlier point, Brother Langston, about, you know, kind of nonprofit, for-profit, uh, Dr. Robinson is actually one of the uh, recognized experts in this idea of social enterprise, mm. says you can actually make a profit and make a difference, Yeah, uh, that your business model can do the good that a nonprofit would do, but also generate the, the uh, financial returns of a for-profit and strike what many would call the double bottom line or the triple bottom line when we bring in the environment as well. So uh, we have a lot more options now at our disposal. Yes. We're willing to be innovative and creative of how we can do well and do good. Yeah. Again, for those of you in the audience, if you have a question, you can type it in the chat. You can type it in the q and I want to give you all that, a chance to answer, ask any questions if you have, no pressure. Um, and while, while the audience takes the time to do that, I'm going to pivot a little bit. So this, is, this isn't ex explicitly addressed as part of the book, but as I mentioned before, like mentorship is, 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 is a lot of times collaboration across ages. It's different age groups because so, someone's going to be more experienced than the other person. And naturally you get more experience with time typically. Not always the case, but it's, it's definitely correlated. And this is, this is a thought I want to share with you all when I get your perspective. I think all Black organizations, so I'm not Greek, but this is what I believe. I believe if you're a Greek organization, if you're the 100 Black men, 100 Black women, if you're a local nonprofit, if you're a Black chamber of commerce, if you're a Black whatever, on that board, you need to have representation from every decade of adult. So meaning for your board to be viable, you need a 20-year-old, you need a 30-year-old, you need a 40-year-old. And those, those three decades have to be mandatory on the board. Because what I see now, and just trending, this is what I see locally, that all the power is consolidated with the elders, but they're missing the perspective <clears throat> and the input. And I, my mentors had this conversation just in passing at UT. They were like, yo, you know what these white boys do? Mm -hmm. These white guys, they take a white guy out of college and they say he's going to be CEO by the time he's 40 and they accelerate him. Mm. And like, we're sitting here as millennials, 40 years old, like, yo, how come I can't get on the board? Right. I got higher status in my mainstream institution than I do in my black organization. And so I just want, I want, I want you all's thoughts on intergenerational 
affirmative action within black organizations. <laughs> and, and, and this is the core of what it means to be a black face in a high place, which is we're not arguing just to get to the top and stay there, even though that's the book subtitle. Yeah. We're arguing to get to the stop, to the top, stay there. And when you have the levers of power at your disposal, to not be afraid to exercise them for the benefit of Black people, to be unapologetic, to say, I'm going to intentionally put a young African American on my board. I'm going to intentionally hire a, a recent HBCU grad um, into a prominent business. And I'll give you a great, perfect story. You'll love this, Langston. Yeah. So. One of our one of our partners, Lawrence and I, our children went to the same daycare center mm -hmm. facility yeah. run by Miss Janice, who was at First Baptist Church of Lincoln Garden. Okay. <laughs> so Miss Janice, that's a real black sounding yeah, that's right. uh, reference, right? Miss Janice yeah. took care, took care of our kids. So one day I'm picking up my daughter from Miss Janice, and she says, Hey, uh, Randall, you know, my son just finished college and he can't find work. He's working as a security guard at a university, just sitting there at a booth, but he can't find work. I said, Miss Jan, send him to me. I said, let me learn more about his interest, what he's doing, let's see what we can do. I talked to Larry. Larry's like, oh, Miss Jan's son's looking for work. He said, really? He said, yeah, Miss Jan's son. So we, yeah. we talked to the cat, championship athlete, great grades, thoughtful. We, 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 we were smaller. We couldn't afford to hire him. He said, look, you want to volunteer for us, we'll get you some work experience. Yeah. So cat comes in, volunteers for us. He does so well. We got a we got a create a job for this guy. We got to create a job for him. He's yeah. he's a baller. Yeah. So we create a job for him by word of Miss Janice. He is today our chief operating officer. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's right. He's the second in command. Yeah. The joke, the, the dude that we got from Miss Janice at the daycare yeah. is running BCT. That's right. <laughs> That's the that's story, right? right? Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. That's the story. Yeah. But, but it was, you know, that was intentional. And what you described there, Dr. Clark, I mean, that that was that that's an intentional strategy. Have every decade covered. That's right. And put, put them on the board. Because what we often see is, like you said, a older generation that's in there and don't and 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 doesn't seem to want to to uh walk away, go away or or, or take on a different role. And so then we get we get these gaps in these organizations, right? We get organizations that have, um, you know, people who've been running them for 30, 20, 30 years and there's nobody behind them That's right. uh, to, to pick it up. They've yeah. gone other places because they yeah. didn't want to wait 20 and 30 years. That's right. Yeah, we, 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 got, we got to do better. We got to do better so, as a community. So all, all y'all in San Antonio, don't get mad if we start moving to Austin, okay? <laughs> y all, y all, anyway, let me stop being petty. Um, and that, I think that goes to y'all's point, though, about like the, the, the institution, it's not an institution if it doesn't last beyond you. Mm -hmm. And that to me, and I, and I mentioned this, y'all, there's so many nuggets in the book. That mm -hmm. one is another one that stood out to me. Um, and since we don't have any questions in the chat and no one has raised their hand, I'm going to ask this last question of you all. Um, we, we have, oh, Dr. Whitlock raised the hand. So Tyvee, give me two seconds. I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna make it so you can ask your question real quick. And I'm gonna allow you to talk and you can unmute and you can ask your question. And Tyvee, Tyvee is like an original book club member All of right. ours too. So Dr. Dr. Whitlock, go ahead. Dr. Whitlock. Ah, uh, you put me on the spot, Langston. Um, I, I, I was trying to type and get my words together right on this one because I don't want to offend and I, I, I want to be authentic to the question that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you. I'm so excited. I've just ordered the book and I can't wait to read it when it comes uh, on the weekend. Um, but my question is, you know, I um, I'm just remembering back to my youth and, you know, getting out of college and just being on fire to just uh, be a part of the community and um, help the, the, the next generation and just um, being so discouraged um, in my attempts to uh, be a part of 
uh, black organizations where there were uh, black leaders and 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 I'm, I'm just being honest, you know, even today, and I'm, I'm a part of some great organizations that have done some great things, but um, if I was honest, I would say that I have not seen an example of black leaders working well together and positively. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if I have a question on that, but I'm just wondering if you can speak on that or if there were um, examples um, that can be pulled from and modeled of um, um, like a, a benchmark of, you know, black leadership that is working effectively, because I think we need to do a better job of that. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate the authenticity. And in some ways, your question has shades of Dr. Clark's commentary a moment ago. Um, you're both painting a picture of the fact that while power concedes nothing without a struggle, that includes black power. Black power <laughs> concedes nothing without a struggle. And when we see the absence of intergenerational transfer of power, that means we've got more work to do mm. in order to see our younger brothers and sisters as the recipients of the baton and not the adversaries of our power. Um, now, having said that, uh, Dr. Whitlock, you are exactly who we wanted to talk to at the beginning of Strategic Action 6. And I mean that literally, like Dr. Robinson and I had this discussion. Strategic Action 6 is entitled Leverage Our Might. Mm. And that's actually a quote from Earl Graves, the founder of Black Enterprise, who said that the number one problem facing Black people is racism. The number two problem facing Black people is leveraging our might. And so we coined it. And so we opened up that chapter, again, getting back to where we started, like we're trying to how to lay out this artwork for the book. We're like, we're gonna first hit them with an example out of the gate. And so we played out the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and played out how they played out in leveraging our might as an example. Then we're gonna hit them philosophically, get them in the head with a concept, Ubuntu, the South African humanist philosophy that says, I am because we are, which is our ancestral roots. We come from a, a, an ancestry of collectivism, but we got lost somewhere along the way, juxtaposed against the Eurocentric ethos of I think, therefore I am. And then right to you, Dr. Whitlock, we said we're gonna hit them with examples, example after example. And we, we, we go, I got the book right here in front of me, we give you Madam C.J. Walker, Black Wall Street, the bankers, Maynard Jackson, the Rutgers women's basketball team and our pastor, DeForest Stories. And in the more modern day, if you're looking to the more modern day, the Black Economic Alliance, a coalition of business leaders and aligned advocates committed to economic progress and prosperity in the Black community. So when you get your book, I want you to do what Dr. Clark said. Don't start from the beginning and go linearly. I want you to write the strategic action six. <laughs> That's where I want you to start. And you're gonna you're gonna get bombarded with example after example of black leaders working together. Yeah. And yo, know, that that was one of the most important strategic actions, not chapters, strategic actions in the book. Um, doctors Robinson and Dr. Pinkett, um, I want to thank you both for coming here. I know we're at time, I want to respect over your time. I'm gonna ask this last question. You got one in the chat too. You got oh, a, we got we got another one. Uh, Kelly okay. Cameron asked uh, a, a a question, and then I think another, another follow up question. Yeah. So so Kim, to your point about the two chambers, I don't know that drama happened way before my time here in San Antonio. So I, I don't know all the history behind that, and I would say that it's been difficult to figure out which one to join and which one to support. Because I think in some ways, us that live here, where where we are, we, we just want to join and support the chambers. Right. It's, it's me joining is like a type of philanthropy. Like I, I want I, I want to cheerfully give to an organization or organizations that are supporting black businesses in this community. And um, I wish I had a better answer for you specific about the two chambers. Um, and then she asked panelists, is it possible to have a modern era Black Wall Street, but on a larger, wider and broader scale? So how do you all see Black Wall Street manifesting in a modern era? 
Yes, if we, you know, I've had versions of this question before, and it, it, it's a challenging one because you know there's a we have not only a nostalgia but a, a sort of a deep rooted desire to see uh, black entrepreneurs succeed, right? Uh, but the you know the conditions under which Black Wall Street uh, emerged was a different era, different time, and different laws, Jim Crow where we were segregated into you know, certain neighborhoods and, and, and places uh, by, by law and therefore didn't have a whole lot of options um, to, as to where we would go and buy our stuff. Today, you know, but we got all kinds of options. We don't have those same laws and in, in, you know, although we, we can argue about segregation, but it's not by law and it's not, and there's nothing preventing us from going and, and buying from, from everybody else. Um, you know, Maggie Anderson um, had a book uh, and, and a whole year of, of buying black, trying to buy everything in her household from a black owned business. And if she said it was a struggle yeah. <laughs> to do it. So, you know, again, we, how do we co connect all of that in a, in an era of uh, where, where we've got online competition and you, know, you mentioned, you know, Walmart, big box store uh, competition and everything else out there. And a, an era where we have a, a lot more less, a lot, I should say this, a lot less solidarity, um, you know, than, than we did perhaps back in uh, the early 1920s. I think it's a very big challenge. I don't, I don't think it's, uh, you know, not that we, we should not be promoting black business, but to say to have a black Wall Street where every business, everything is there and that uh, it is it's self replicating and um, allows for black people to buy from uh, other black people almost exclusively, that's a, that's a, a tall order. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have a, uh, a, a you know, quote unquote, a street or set of businesses that we um, are going to uh, consistently. That is still a mindset change for a lot of our community and uh, would be a, still a big challenge for us. To, Let me just give a do. plug for... Uh we buy black.com i am a huge supporter of this website it's like the black amazon you can get mm -hmm. everyday products um, online uh, dr robinson knows i've gifted this to his family um, i've made a pledge to myself whenever i give gifts no matter what the gifts are at least one of them will be a black owned yeah. uh product so i go to we we buy black.com to help fulfill that that personal pledge to myself yeah and and again, the, the I think chapter six is talk. Excuse me, strategic action six talks about that, right? And so, black folks working with black folks, yeah. However, that looks could be a website, right? We buy black.com. Right. Can, can, it can be a, a number of businesses. You know, get, we 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 always are trying to get into uh, supplier development programs and these kind of things. Um, you know, how, what are we doing inside our own house? Um, and so th this, the, these are, these are critical questions. I got lots of folks who, who, uh, who are thinking about that. I, I, and we, we can have a, a whole nother show just on that. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're getting to time and, uh, Kelly, I apologize. Kelly, he, him, not she, her, my fault. Um, I want to, I want to end with this question. So Dr. Robinson, Dr. Pinkett, what? If you had to write one more chapter in the book, or if there was a concept in a book that you wanted to add but you couldn't, what would it be? Oh, you got you got deep on it, bro. Oh, you got deep on it, bro. That's a tough one. Oh, <laughs> so just I, I looked at I looked at all y'all's previous interviews on YouTube, and I, <laughs> I I tried to figure out how I can make make this one different because a lot of people ask y'all the same questions. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, you know, there's, there's certainly one thing I think I'd like to have um, some more examples of, um, of of people who, you know, have gone through some of the arc we're, that we're describing. You know, we we had we we have a lot of great examples and stories, but we there there's some more stories we could have told. There's some there's some some juicy stories. Uh, we we give some snapshots, but it would be interesting to follow. The arc of 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 uh, of of a person who's done these things mm. as a com complete sort of cohesive story, yeah. Where they they tell the story about how they 
um, you know, they found themselves and found meaning and then what they did to be uh, entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial um, and then started to transform systems. Uh, again, we, we, I know we tell some of those stories uh, a little bit, but, but they're, they're, they're broken up because of the, uh, the, the way that we have each of these strategic actions. What if we could put all that together? That might be a, a, another ad for the book. So it sounds like to me, y'all gonna write the Black Alchemist. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like. If y'all, listen, for real, I think it would be dope if y'all wrote like a quasi-fiction Black version of the Alchemist. Like, what 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 does it look like? And for mm. y'all, those of y'all don't know, The Alchemist is a great book, like story about like finding yourself and, and all of that stuff. I haven't read it. I just heard stories about it. Um, but it's it's one of those business business classics. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll add the, the final footnote. Uh, it was during an interview that uh, Dr. Robinson serendipitously developed a nice acronym that we that is not in the book, but it actually does an excellent job of capturing succinctly some of the spirit of being a black face in a high place, and it's called the the secret sauce S A U C E, and the, and you could do a chapter on each of the of the letters of the acronym. The first is being strategic. The second is being authentic. The third is being unapologetic. And then last is being community engaged. S-A-U-C-E, the secret sauce. sauce. That's, yes, right. <laughs> That's right. So uh, both of you, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Pinkett, again, I appreciate you all coming on here. Half of the reason why I started to do the podcast because I want to meet people that I look up to. And so <laughs> I appreciate both of you all coming and sharing your knowledge. Those of you who are in the audience, uh, those of you who will listen to the recording of this, make sure you pick up both books. The first one, Black Faces in White Places, and the more recent one, Black Faces in High Places, which are both giving us strategic actions to succeed wherever we may be. Um, and so for those of you who are listening, I'm going to ask you all to stay. I'm going to talk about what we have for next month's book discussion and maybe give you all some insights of what's going to happen in 2023. Uh, Drs. Robinson and Pinkett, I thank you both for being here. I know it's late in New Jersey right now, so if y'all want to log off, uh, you can, and I, I appreciate you all for coming and supporting this. This has been the most attended live discussion I've had in about six months. All right. So okay. we got like 20, 23, 24 people at max who showed up here for the live discussion. And so you all were really a draw and people are interested in what you all had to write about and what you had to say. So thank you both for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us, brother. Thank you, brother, doctor. Thank you. All right, everybody. So give me one second. I appreciate both of you for coming. Uh, the audience, I'm going to ask y'all to stay for a little while longer. Let me share my screen. I can tell you what we have coming up. And so as I mentioned, for some of you who came on a little bit later, I have another podcast called the African Americans in Sport Pod Class. And uh, we talk about the experiences of Black folk in sports, whether they be athletes, former student athletes, college professors, working with athletes, historians, the whole nine. Um, and also want to make you all aware that we do have a Patreon if you want to support what we are doing. One of the things that I want to do with the podcast is hire a Black intern. And so Drs. Pinkett and Robinson talked about the opportunity that they had to take a young brother who was a former student athlete, uh, who was a good student in college and was working as a security guard and give him an opportunity to get some experience. And so I want to do the same thing uh, for a young brother or sister in our community. And so that's why I started the Founding 55 patron. And so as a patron, uh, as a member of the Founding 55, you, you pay $5 a month. And that goes to help with the production of the show, which is what I want the internship, the intern to help me do. And so uh, it takes a lot of time for me to edit uh, the podcast and put it up and make it accessible to, to folks after we do the live discussions. And so I want to be able to train someone how to edit, produce, and do everything that's necessary to build their own podcast. And podcasting is an industry that is blowing up. Uh, so I just want to make you all aware that if you support us, as a member of our Founding 55, you can use the QR code there. You get access to our monthly book discussions and you get access to the recordings. If you miss a live discussion, you get all that all that early. So uh, again, please consider joining and becoming one of our Founding 55 patrons on Patreon. And 
Last but not least, we're going to continue the conversation about entrepreneurship. And so uh, next month, we're going to have a conversation with Stephen S. Rogers, who is a retired professor of business at Harvard Business School. And he recently wrote a book. I think it's, it's, case, it's a case study book on successful Black entrepreneurs. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to ease out of 2022 on a high note, really focusing on Black businesses, the impact of Black folk on the economy and things like that. And just uh, some insights as we get into 2023. Uh, next year, we're going to start to have conversations that are a bit more curated, talking about Black people who are working in blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, Black people who have businesses in the outdoor industry and all types of niche sort of industries and, and places that we don't think Black people normally exist for their recreation or in business, we're going to expand our view of what it means to be a Black face in a high place. So thank you all for joining. I appreciate your support. All of your support goes to support this business and to the endowment uh, that I've started with my friends at North Carolina A&T State University. So thank you all for joining us and have a good evening.